Section 2.7 is about two variable inequalities. Let's go back to one variable and just look at what we did in one variable situations. Now, in a one variable situation, when I ask you to graph x is greater than 3, you would probably put an open circle on 3 and your arrow would go to the right. Okay. Or if it was greater than or equal to 3, you would have a closed circle and an arrow to the right, indicating all the values bigger than 3. This one includes 3. This one does not. How would that look different if we switched gears and we went to a two-variable situation? In other words, we have an x-axis and a y-axis. Now, we know, everybody should know, what x equals 3 looks like. Everybody should know that x equals 3 is a vertical line. Now, this particular one says that we do not want that vertical line, but we want everything to the right of it. So here's how I would indicate that. Hopefully you remember this idea of a dashed line instead of an open circle. But it's got the same idea. The idea of the open circle and the dashed line are similar. One being one variable and one being two variable to tell me that I don't want that particular value. But because I'm looking for greater than three, I would shade everything to the right. And so the idea of shading is the same idea as this arrow on a number line. The arrow on the number line tells me which way I'm shading, just like all of the scribbles do. Now, how is that different from this, from the closed circle idea? Well, instead of a dashed line, I would make a solid line at x equals 3. All right, 1, 2, 3. And then I would shade everything to the right. So, similar idea, dotted line or solid line based on what the symbol says. Now, I bring this example to you because a lot of kids forget about the vertical line situation. We're going to be graphing other types of situations. And so you'll be very used to thinking about y equals mx plus b and finding a slope and a y-intercept and plot the points and draw the line. And Oh, it's got to be a dashed line or no, it's going to be a solid line. Which side of the line do you have to shade on? And then I'll give an example like this on a quiz or test or practice problem in class and everybody gets stuck. Everybody just is like, uh, uh, I don't know what to do. Keep the vertical line um, example in your mind because you may need it to come back to come back to that example. So here's an example of what I was talking about earlier. You may have, be asked to graph this. It's a, a linear inequality. I obviously see that it's mx plus b, so it's a it's a line. This is that whole slope intercept thing. And so many of you would know what to do, right? You'd be, oh, go down three, find your first point, use the slope, up one to the right two, up one to the right two, and, but this time, right, down one, back two. This time, instead of a solid line, because it's not equal to, I'm going to use a dashed line. So it's everything I've done before, except I have to think about solid line or dashed line. Now, which side of the line do I need to shade? I will give you one hint. If it's written where, where y is solved for, like as in slope-intercept form, your instincts are going to um, uh, are, will be trustable. In other words, when you see y is smaller than, you're thinking down, well, all the y values that are lower than this line, you would be correct. That is, how, that is a correct assumption. Now, I can write the equation in different ways to try to trick you, uh, but if it's in this form where y is by itself and everything else is on the other side, your instincts will serve you well and they will help you understand whether you should go up or down. Do you want the y values above the line or below the line? Now, the, um, 
the way you can prove to me that, that the point is always true, shaded points are true points. Now, what do you mean by that, Mr. Staley? Well, what I mean by that is, if it's inside the shaded region, every single one of these creates a true statement. For this, for instance, let's pick the point 4, negative 2. 4, negative 2 sits right there. So if I pick, oops, sorry, that's a 1 half, 1 half. 4, negative 2, 4 for x, negative 2 for y. I get negative 2 is less than, well, that's 2 minus 3, or negative 2 is less than negative 1. That's a true statement. So 4, negative 2 must be on the shaded side of the line because I get a true statement. Well, I'm going to show you a point that would give you a false statement. That would be somewhere on this side of the line, anywhere on this side of the line. Now, my favorite point to pick in the whole wide world is 0, 0. Because a lot of nice things happen. Now, one of the important points to note here, when you are selecting a point, don't pick a point to test that's on the line. If you pick a point to test that's, that's on the line, you are going to lose most of the time. At least half the time. Because you'll pick the wrong side. The, point, the, the points on the line don't tell you anything. They won't tell you true or false. So, don't get, uh, don't get used to using that to help you. So, I pick zero, 0, But if zero, 0 is on the line, I never pick it. So, you have to pick something that's not on the line. 0, 0 is clearly not on the line this time. So if I plug it in, I got 0 for y. I also have 0 for x. I get 0 is less than, well, that's 0 minus 3, which is negative 3. Is 0 smaller than negative 3? No, that's false. As soon as I know that it's false, I know that that is not the correct side to shade. So if you pick a point and it ends up giving you a true statement, you shade that side. If you pick a point and it gives you a false statement, you shade the other side. Example two in your book says, it's a story problem, so I'm going to have to put it up here on the big screen so you can take a look at it. At least 35 performers of the Big Tent Circus are in the grand finale. Some pile into cars while others balance on bicycles. Seven performers are in each car. Five performers are on each bicycle. Draw a graph showing all the possible combinations of cars and bicycles that could be used in the finale. Okay, so I, I need this idea of seven, seven performing in, or seven are in each car, five are in each, on, on each bicycle. We need at least 35, at least 35. So, so seven people are in each car, and five people are, in, are on each bicycle. We need at least 35. That's, that, that's my at least right there. So here's my linear function. Now I'm going to be asked to graph this, right? Now, this looks an awful lot like standard form. So typically when we have something in standard form, the easiest way to graph it is to find the x and y intercepts. So if I plug in a 0 for x, remember how we did that cover up thing? 35 divided by 5 gives me 7. And if I plug in 0 for y to find the x intercept, I get 35 divided by 7, which is 5. Such convenient numbers. I love it. Now, because it's equal to, 
I'm going to draw a solid line. Now, does it make sense to you that I'm stopping? I'm not going beyond the axes to any of the negative x's or negative y's because you can't have those values in this situation. Now, at least greater than or equal to 35, that, not, that might cause me to think about shading above the line. And quite honestly, it would be correct because if you take 0, 0 and plug it in, well, we got 7 times 0 plus 5 times 0 is greater than or equal to 35, and definitely not. That is a false statement. Therefore, I would shade. Now, remember, the vertical axis is going this way and the horizontal axis is going this way. So I'm going to shade inside of quadrant 1. Now, why is that really wrong? Technically, this is not the right picture. Even the book shows a graph. Why can't I see the colors? Uh, okay, they've got it shaded up here. Why isn't that a good picture? Just like the other examples we had, we can't have fractional amounts of people. So by shading it like this, I'm saying that I could have all kinds of fractional people. Now, I realize that there are a lot of points that I, sh that I could plot. Uh, and we get sick and tired of doing that. So I will accept this for this situation. But keep that in mind. It's not really the right thing. Now, not doing example three for now. We are doing example four. Suppose you were given a particular graph and you were told that you needed to come up with the inequality for that graph. First of all, you would need to figure out what that line is. Well, it looks like it's got a y-intercept of negative 2. Now, let's see here. Down 1 to the right 3. It's got a negative 1 third for a slope. So, typically, I would put an equal sign in between here. But, that's not true. So, let's take a look at what we have. We have a dashed line, which means it cannot be equal and it is shaded below. My gut instinct is telling me that that would be a less than situation. And the answer to that is correct. It would be a less than situation. So, um, well, let's just test it. Let's pick 0, 0 and plug it in just to make sure I'm right. Uh, negative 1 third times 0 minus 2. That 0 is less than negative 2. 0 is smaller than negative 2. That is definitely false. So that means we were correct because 0, 0 should give me a false statement since it is not in the shaded region. So this was the inequality. So what about the next picture? Looks like 0, 0 should give me a true statement this time. We have a y-intercept at negative 3. We have a slope of down 4 and 1 to the right. So that's a negative 4 slope. Down 4, right down 4, 1 to the right. It is a solid line, so that means it's equal to that. It's going to have an equal to, and we want to shade above that line. So my instinct is to put greater than or equal to in there. Well, let's test it out. Zero, zero is supposed to give us a true statement here. Zero is less than negative four times zero minus three. Zero is greater than or equal to, well, that's zero. Minus three would be minus three. That's definitely a true statement. Therefore, uh, I was correct. My instincts served me well. So, there'll be example problems that we'll do in class like those. And we'll see you later.